All right, folks, hello and welcome back to Online English Class. Hope you guys are doing well today. Uh, today we're going to be working on OTN5, which is going to analyze uh, the rising action of Marlowe's journey, looking specifically at part two, pages 85 through 108. Uh, and today, um, even more specifically, we're going to be discussing Kurtz's continued characterization uh, as the purpose, or telos, uh, of Marlowe's journey, uh, what he uh, is journeying toward, the kind of nexus of meaning around which uh, Marlowe's, the symbolic significance of Marlowe's pilgrimage is going to be based. Okay, uh, before we get into that, uh, let's go ahead and take a, a quick look at the top of the week announcements. All right, so obviously you need to continue your discussion grade uh, procedure duties, leaving a question, a summary, or a reflection on the content that was discussed. You know the difference between a uh, authentically thoughtful uh, uh, comment and a uh, 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 sort of inauthentic, um, uh, just get it done kind of comment, right? Um, make sure that you're leaving something that is an authentic. Uh, 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 response to what you have heard. If you're summarizing the content, do not do not simply say Marlowe's searching for meaning. Okay, that, that's what Marlowe's doing in every scene uh, of the novel, uh, in every portion of the novel Marlowe's searching for meaning. Okay, obviously uh, each scene talks about the specific ways in which that search for meaning, that pilgrimage, develops. Okay, I'd like to hear about that rather than just the, the simple bald statement that Marlowe's searching for meaning. Okay, so uh, make sure that your responses are authentic uh, and that reflect the fact that despite the fact that you are at home, you are still a student. And because you are a student, right, you behave like a student, all right, uh, because you are honest, all right. So let's make sure that that's happening, okay. Um, uh, aside from that, you need to make sure that you email me your reading check for Heart of Darkness Part 2 by 3 p.m. today. Um, uh, throughout the course of this week, you are going to read Part 3 of Heart of Darkness. Okay. Uh, by Tuesday, which is tomorrow at 3 p.m., uh, I need email confirmation of your completions of OTNs 2, 3, and 4. That will be for a tri-weighted homework grade. Okay, So three homework grades in one, uh, all evaluating whether or not you have completed these assignments. If you have not completed all three of them, then do not tell me that you have. All right, Make sure that you tell me uh, an accurate representation of the extent to which you have completed those assignments. All right. Uh, finally, make sure that you are working through your OTNs as we complete them in class and contextualizing all this is your work on the quarter four essay. The quarter four essay will be due anytime from May 18th to May 22nd. All right, that's the last week of school. It'll be the last uh, thing that you turn in to me, uh, that quarter four essay. And we're gonna be looking at it specifically and working on it uh, specifically after we complete uh, the unit six test and complete our studies on Heart of Darkness, okay? So, uh, let's go ahead and turn our attention back to OTN5 uh, and look at uh, the development of Marlowe's quest for an idea, an ideal at the back of his life. All right. So, uh, on Friday, uh, in our SQ3R, we uh, basically introduced uh, this extended section of text. We're going to be looking at the beginning, uh, just a few pages uh, uh, in, in the beginning of this section of text, and we're going to be spending a couple days looking at the development of the Congolese environment as Marlowe grows uh, more and more acquainted, uh, more and more um, uh, uh, sort of pressed into uh, the heart of this natural environment. Okay, uh, but before we do that, right, we're just going to look at uh, Marlowe's continued characterization as the purpose of Marlowe's journey. Okay, so up to this point, right, Kurtz has already sort of uh, begun to be conceived of by Marlowe as a kind of modern Christ figure or a, uh, a modern uh, messianic figure whose work right, uh, whose honesty, whose exceptionality redeems the moral chaos and moral incoherency or moral incomprehensibility uh, of the work that Marlowe has seen that is being undertaken in the Congo by the Belgian Congo Company, okay? So Kurtz is an exception to all of that chaos, all of that duplicity, and all of that hypocrisy. Uh, and as such, he becomes a kind of obsession of Marlowe. And symbolically, it follows, right, that Marlowe's uh, uh, sort of task in the Congo, his actual literal job is to find Kurtz and to save Kurtz, right? Kurtz is ill. He's growing sick. And Marlowe's going to uh, find him, 
uh, care for him, uh, continue to carry on the fire that Kurtz carries. Okay, so um, uh, uh, th this impression is kind of developed for us and expanded for us in the beginning part of part two, in which Marlowe begins to see Kurtz more clearly. And we, as Marlowe responds to Kurtz, we begin to see Marlowe more clearly, uh, and also, right, uh, through his juxtaposition or contrast with the other characters who see what Kurtz represents and reject it, or think of it as a threat to their well-being, to their power, uh, to their uh, sort of carnal, uh, uh, materialistic worldview, okay? So, uh, at the beginning of part two, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the scene that we're going to be analyzing, okay? Uh, at the beginning of part two, Marlowe uh, is lying down on the deck of his steamship, all right? Uh, he's just uh, about to go to sleep. Uh, and obviously, the steamship is up on stilts, okay? Uh, so, it's raised up because he's got to work on the hull of the ship, uh, which got uh, ripped up. Um, uh, when some incompetent people uh, took the steamship out onto the river and ran it uh, into some rocks, okay? So, uh, he's been working on a steamship. He sticks to this salvage day and night. Obviously, we talked about the symbolic significance of the steamboat, but just literally, right, uh, he's sleeping on the steamer, and beneath him, the manager and the manager's uncle, uh, who is the head of this thing called the El Dorado Expedition, are talking beneath him, all right? And the manager, although uh, outwardly, uh, has to follow orders to go and save Kurtz uh, because Kurtz is a very valuable agent and he'll lose his job if he doesn't protect one of the uh, Belgian Congo Company's most valuable assets, Kurtz, uh, who, it, who runs the most profitable station uh, in all the Congo, all right, the inner station where all the best uh, prime ivory comes from, okay? Uh, uh, while outwardly sort of needing to protect Kurtz Okay, uh, and, uh, and, and, and leading the mission to go and sa save him, uh, inwardly, right, the manager hates Kurtz uh, and views Kurtz as a threat to his authority because he believes, probably rightly, that Kurtz uh, is in line for a promotion to manager of the company and deserves to be manager of the company because he's a better man than the manager, okay? So, uh, uh, to sort of illustrate uh, or, or uh, sort of um, offer a, a concrete articulation of what kind of man Kurtz is, right, the manager tells this story to his uncle uh, about a time when Kurtz was coming down the river out of the interstation, okay, uh, and, and he has all this ivory, okay, so, so uh, uh, tons of uh, of this very valuable material uh, that would make him a very rich man uh, uh, if he simply uh, uh, took the commissions from, uh, from, from all of this ivory, went home, went back to Belgium, got married to the woman that's waiting for him called his intended, all right, uh, and got uh, you know, all the promotions, all the glory, and all the power that was waiting for him if he simply just followed uh, the kind of normal uh, 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 progression for a member of the company, right? If he just did what was normal, right? Uh, if he just had some sort of common sense about things. But, right, Kurtz doesn't do that. Kurtz doesn't behave that way, right? Well, what does Kurtz do? Well, on his way back, right, uh, he has this half cast clerk uh, that Kurtz has with him, uh, and Kurtz apparently intended to return himself, okay, uh, to head back to Europe, right, uh, the station being by that time bare of goods and stores, so the inner station no longer has sufficient supplies. But after coming 300 miles, had suddenly decided to go back to the inner station, which he started to do alone in a small dugout canoe with four paddlers, leaving the half-cast to continue down the river with the ivory. Okay. So, Kurtz abandons the ivory, gives it to his assistant, and heads back to the inner station. The two fellows there seemed astounded. Okay, In other words, the manager and his uncle seems astounded that anybody would do such a thing. Okay, They were at a loss for an adequate 
motive. All right. So here, right, how is Kurtz characterized? Well, first and foremost, he seems to be characterized as a man who is not simply motivated by the materialism that seems to be at the root of the rest of the Belgian Congo Company's efforts. He, unlike the rest of the morally incoherent individuals that Marlowe has come across, seems to work not simply for material gain, although he is excellent uh, at his job, right? Uh, he's not bad at his job. He's the best at his job, but he doesn't do that job simply for money, simply for power, simply for status, uh, or any of the other sort of material carnal goals that uh, the rest of the Belgian Congo company, including the manager and the uncle, seem to be able to understand, right? That's a language that they understand, and that's why they're so astounded or at a loss that anyone uh, would do what Kurtz has done, okay? In sharp juxtaposition, to their response, as to me, I seem to see Kurtz for the first time. In other words, just as the manager and the manager's uncle cannot possibly understand why a man would ever do such a thing as that, right? Marlowe, for the first time, sees Kurtz and goes, I finally get this guy. I see what's up with this guy. It was a distinct glimpse. The dugout, four paddling savages, and the lone white man turning his back suddenly on the headquarters, on relief, on thoughts of home. Okay, so think of just just on safety, security, power, wealth. Turning his back on all of those things, setting his face towards the depths of the wilderness, towards his empty and desolate station. I did not know the motive, okay? In other words, he, like the manager and the manager's uncle, doesn't know the motive specifically, but unlike the manager uh, and, uh, and the manager's uncle, he doesn't seem to say, uh, he doesn't seem to respond to this by saying, there couldn't be any motive. This is obviously insanity. This is astounding. We're at a loss for an adequate explanation. This is not, uh, this is not incomprehensible to Marlowe. It's the first thing that Marlowe has seen that actually makes much of any sense. That a man is there doing what he said he was going to do. And that is, right, to wield a kind of sacred fire. Not simply uh, a kind of money grab, right, uh, in Africa by people who happen to be more uh, uh, technologically advanced than other individuals, right, other people, but rather a man who sticks to his work for its own sake, who sticks to his work because that work is inherently good, not because of the consequences, not because of the payoff, but because the work is good for its own sake, okay? That is a kind of labor that appeals to Marlowe because Marlowe is looking for, in, in all of this sort of pilgrimage, right? What is Marlowe looking for? He's looking for an idea at the back of his life, an idea at the back of his and others' work. And unlike the rest of the Belgian Congo company that does not seem to have any sort of moral cohesion, which is instinctual to long for for the human creature, uh, and also very, very obviously for Marlowe, right? Unlike the rest of that incomprehensibility, Mo Kurtz seems to have a comprehensible, coherent ideal that he is working for that transcends, that is above and beyond all material kinds of wealth and safety and comfort, okay? Perhaps Marlowe is beginning to understand Kurtz is a fine fellow, a good man who simply sticks to his work for its own sake, all right? Uh, Right, uh, the, the manager and uh, uh, the manager's uncle also, also sort of mock 
Kurtz because Kurtz believes that every station should be like a beacon on the road towards better things, a center for trade, but also for humanizing, improving, instructing. Okay? Conceive you, that ass, he wants to be manager, right? So again, the, the, just reiterating this fact, right? That the manager and the manager's uncle, when confronted with a person who actually wants to do stuff that is good, all right? Who actually wants um, to, to do the work, the colonial work that the colonist said that they were going to do, whether or not they were genuinely going to humanize uh, the, these individuals or were capable of doing that, right? That they are human beings, right? They're not some sort of lesser creature and, and the Europeans are some higher creature. But the fact that they said they were going to do it and that he wants to actually do it, right, baffles the manager because the manager is perfectly fine, all right, uh, with a morally incoherent world. Uh, hence his statement back in part one that if you're going to make it out here, you need to be empty inside. You need to have nothing inside you, right? Uh, uh, the manager seems to have nothing inside, right? This scene comes to an end when the manager's uncle, uh, to comfort the manager, uh, who is fearful that he will lose his position, simply right says ah my boy trust to this what 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 is he referring to when he says this i say trust to this and then he extends his flipper of an arm for a gesture that took in the forest the creek the mud the river seemed to beckon with a dishonoring flourish before the sunlit face of the land, a treacherous appeal to the lurking death, to the hidden evil, to the profound darkness of its heart. Okay. In other words, here, the uncle gestures to nature, just gestures to the forest, gestures to the Congo, and says, if anything will kill Kurtz, and also the idealism, right, that he uh, uh, that he embodies. If anything will take care of this threat to you, nephew, it is nature. Nature will kill Kurtz's idealism. All right. So uh, in our uh, in our lectures that follow this, we're going to be discussing all right, what exactly that means, how exactly nature uh, sets itself against Kurtz's idealism and what it means about nature that it does so. Okay, hope you guys have uh, an excellent day. Uh, and that's all we have today. We've got a short, uh, pretty short class here. So uh, make sure that you are keeping up with your OTN. Make sure that you're analyzing this section uh, of text carefully uh, and that you are working on your essay. All right, uh, have a great day.